Hello everyone and happy Wednesday. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Brian Williamson. I am the general manager for the Marsh and Marsh Stream. Um, I have just a few housekeeping things before we get started with tonight's show. First, I know we don't have to worry about muting our cell phone for tonight's show. However, if you would consider using that cell phone and visiting our website, www.themarsh.org, and make a tax-deductible donation to our tip jar, your support helps us continue to bring these free community performances every night of the week. Um, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to both our YouTube channel and our newsletter, and stay up to date with everything Marsh and Marshstream has to offer. But now, enjoy tonight's Solo Arts Heal episode featuring the super talented Cynthia Shaw and all hosted by our amazing hostess, Gail Shickley. Hello, Gail. Thank you so much. And thanks to Marsh Stream for offering community service with nightly entertainment inspired by 30 years, 31 years now of the Marsh Breeding Ground for new performance. And I'm really looking forward to the International Solo Fest coming up the 7th through the 11th. Um, that's going to be really fabulous, too. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Solo Arts Heal. It's terrific to have our Solo Arts Heal group as part of the Marsh Stream, a collective of independent theater and musical solo show artists whose performances are united by a common theme of healing, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Here, we present excerpts and talkbacks with audiences, but full performances are developed to work in settings from theaters to medical centers to community nonprofits and other healing environments. Solo Arts Heal is a theater of resilience, a vision born from artists' true stories that celebrate overcoming adversity and promote health advocacy, transformative experiences for audiences, performance and informants, as we like to say, on health and wellness-related issues, including the health crisis of climate change, which we're doing once a month, and what we can do about that health crisis. It's education and inspiration for your empowerment Solo Arts Heal embraces the healing power of the arts. As we have for you tonight with Cynthia Shaw's story of overcoming her many paths of adversity through resilience and velvet determination, the title of her show, an excerpt which we'll enjoy, followed by her talk back with me and psychotherapist Greg Rowe. Let me introduce you to Cynthia Shaw. Cynthia Shaw is a Brooklyn-based pianist, actor, and singer a graduate of the University of Denver and the prestigious Manhattan School of Music. She has dedicated her life to music and acting. As a professional singer, she sang backup vocals for Paul McCartney at Carnegie Hall and with the New York Philharmonic when they won three Grammy Awards. For 15 years, she musical directed the New York's uh, New York Christmas Revels in their annual show and accompanied them in performance for Garrison Keillor on The Prairie Home Companion. She's musical directed over 30 musicals and acted in New York City, off-Broadway and regional theaters, including favorite roles in Me and Jezebel, Summer and Smoke, and in a musical retelling of Chekhov plays. Her film work has been presented at Cannes, film, uh, Cannes Festival Corner, the Soho International Film Festival, and the Big Apple Film Festival. Her recent film, Dern It, which she produced and has a lead role, will screen at New York's Chelsea Film Festival this October. Velvet Determination, her one-woman solo show, won Best Festival Debut at New York City's United Solo Festival at Theatre Row and has won many other awards as she's performed it in the festival circuit. So now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming with an excerpt performance from her solo show, Velvet Determination. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and welcome to my world, the world of the piano. Except I have to turn it on. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you. 
playing classical piano my entire life. It's inside of me, really. I think about it all the time. Well, actually, I think about my hair all the time. Does it, does it look okay in Zoom? Anyway, even before I was in kindergarten, I was plunking away at the keys, so my parents sent me for piano lessons. One of my first teachers had bright orange hair and she smoked cigarettes while I was playing. But she taught me songs with descriptive names like country gardens. It's very English, you know. Or the skater's waltz. I can see the skaters skating. Or my favorite, the Cossack dance. Russian steps right now. Playing the piano was so fun and if I made a mistake it didn't really matter. When I was seven years old my mom and I were in the waiting room of my pediatrician's office and what did I see but a New Yorker magazine. I picked it up and I read goings on about town and there were all these listings for performances the Beatles were performing at Carnegie Hall. There was a musical called Oliver, a, a comedy called The Odd Couple, even a play called Las, uh, Christmas in Las Vegas. And they were all happening in New York City. New York City, what kind of magical place was this? New York City. I wanted to be there and not here. And by here, I mean... Pueblo, Colorado. On the prairie, between the Rocky Mountains and the Arkansas River. Right smack dab in the middle of nowhere. Pueblo was called the Pittsburgh of the West because the main industry was the steel mill. But Colorado people called it the armpit of the West because the mill reeked of this metallic, rotten egg smell. This is where I grew up. And this is what I played. This is supposed to be Bach. Oh, our poor old piano was so beat up and beyond repair. So my folks splurged and ordered a new piano from back east. But what well, we called any place east of the Mississippi River, back east. When the new piano arrived, I played my Bach on it. So much better, right? Now, I was never taught technique. And what I mean by technique is scales and arpeggios and the dreaded hand and exercises. These were all designed to teach us patterns and make our fingers stronger. But because I never had any technique, I just struggled with my little fingers trying to push down the heavy, gigantic piano keys. I never played recitals and I never had to memorize my music, but you put any music down in front of me, I could play it. I hate, I'd hate when we'd go visit my parents' friends and my mom would turn to me and say, Cynthia, what, why don't you play something for us? And I'd be like, no, I don't have my music with me and I don't have anything memorized because my brain isn't big enough to hold all of the notes. But Music was my shining star. I was special because I played the piano. Not everyone played the piano, but I did. And yet, I always felt like I wasn't good enough and no one wanted to listen to me. You see, my family was divided into two groups. My mom, my sister Jessie, who played the flute, and me, in one group, and my dad, in another. Daddy played trombone and he loved jazz and big band music. So even though he had a nine to five job at a TV station, on evenings and weekends, he was off playing music. 
and leaving my poor mom home alone by herself, which she didn't like very much. Daddy was like this, like this distant God, this quiet, smart, creative, playful, always designing and building things. He was calm and logical and not emotional like my mom. I wanted to be exactly like him. So while Jesse and I practiced our classical music and our flute and piano duets together, my dad was off doing his own thing. Ago that I realized that musical families play together, like the whole family, all the time. I mean, the Von Trapp family did, the, the Carter family, even the Partridge family on TV, but not us. My dad only played with this blind jazz pianist, Leon Dudley. And as a kid, I thought, well, daddy doesn't play with me because I'm not blind. You know, kid thinking. Even when I was in high school, he would, play, he would play gigs with jazz guys from my class, and he would come home and wax poetic about them. I was jealous. I wanted him to play with me. He, it was like jazz was daddy's territory. It was like this private club that I wasn't allowed to join. Daddy was a jazz musician. I played classical. And... Daddy kind of looked down his nose at classical, but my mother loved it. So she found our piano teachers, she took us to our lessons, she made sure we practiced, but because she wasn't a musician, her support didn't mean as much to me. And she resented my father's music making and his lack of involvement in our family life. She so desperately wanted him to be in our world and he was not, and it was all music's fault. And even if we were together, we weren't. One time she convinced my dad to take us all to the Great Sand Dunes National Park. So while she and Jesse and I climbed the dunes, laughing and joking and having a really great time, my dad was in the parking lot, standing outside the car in his good shoes, smoking a cigarette, tapping his foot and waiting for us to finish. At nighttime, I'd hear my parents arguing, my mom's shouts, my dad's silence. It got so bad that my mom couldn't take it anymore and she ran off to the mountains, her purse full of sleeping pills. My dad was frantic. Thankfully, she came back. Whispering hold, oh, That's Whispering Hope, an old Victorian song. My grandmother Mimi, my dad's mother, taught it to Jesse and me when we were kids. She had been a silent movie pianist in Oklahoma, but had made a bad marriage to my grandfather and ultimately escaped with nervous breakdowns and pills, running away. Everyone was always running away, wishing they were someplace else. I guess that was safer and easier than saying what it was you really wanted or expressing how you really felt. We didn't do that. So I closed up. My mom told me I was a cold fish. But I just felt like a, a beautiful box on the outside and empty on the inside. I mean, not that I thought I was physically beautiful because I did not think that at all. I just felt it just felt fake on the outside and not good enough on the inside.
was determined to leave Pueblo and got into college as a piano major at the University of Denver. My new piano teacher was Francisco Ibar, and I adored him. At one of my lessons, he boasted, Last week in New York, I ran into the very famous pianist Rudolf Serkin at Pedelsen's, and he asked me what tempo I take the slow section of the Brahms B minor Rhapsody. Rudolf Serkin? And, and what is Pedelsen's? Oh, Cynthia, Pedelsen's is just the most important music store in New York. It's right behind Carnegie Hall. You'll go there one day. Hmm. Oh, by the way, here is a sheet listing all of the major and minor scales and arpeggios you'll need to know for next week's jury. I had never seen this before, and I couldn't play my scales and arpeggios, but I could play Brahms. And with that, I won the annual concerto competition. Mr. Ibar suggested that I should audition for graduate school at his alma mater, the Manhattan School of Music in New York City. I was honored. He had not mentioned that to any of his other students. I'd never been to New York, but for some reason, I knew that that's where I belonged. I don't know how I knew that. I mean, maybe that New Yorker magazine from all so long ago. I don't know. But I just knew. And I could hardly wait for my audition. Now, going to New York was huge. In fact, it was so huge that I skipped my college graduation to fly to New York for the audition. My sister Jessie came with me. When we got there, I quickly realized that New York was very different than Pueblo. For one thing, everybody in New York walks. In Pueblo, if people see you walking down the street, they think your car is broken and they offer to pick you up and give you a ride. Pueblo people pop in on each, uh, each other, on their neighbors. People in New York don't even know who their neighbors are. People in Pueblo wear bright colored clothes, but everyone in New York is dressed in black like there's a citywide funeral going on. Men in business, business suits walk down the street licking ice creams, cones. New York, this was totally different and I loved it. Now, the next day was my audition. Jesse and I decided to walk to Manhattan School of Music. It was over two miles, and by the time I got there, I was totally exhausted. When I walked into the audition room, there at this long table were all these old, wrinkly piano teachers. It kind of looked like that famous painting of The Last Supper. Oh, hi, I'm, I, I'm Cynthia Shaw, and I'm from Pueblo, Colorado, and I'll be playing Beethoven. Oh, yeah. Don't go too fast.
I didn't get in. I wasn't good enough. My life was over. What was I gonna do? Stay in Pueblo and work at McDonald's? I had to get out of Pueblo. I, I wasn't gonna be like my dad and spend the rest of my life, waste my entire life in Pueblo. I had to leave Pueblo. I had to make it in New York. And amazingly, my parents let me go. So on a warm, sunny September day, I flew to New York City and I was on a mission. Audition for Manhattan School and get into the Manhattan School of Music. And I did. As difficult as school was, and as much as I thought I wasn't as good as everyone else, I did get my degree in piano performance from the Manhattan School of Music, my master's degree. When I did my recital, my master's recital, my mom and my dad and my sister came. My parents had never even been to New York before. I knew my dad was proud of me, but he didn't really say anything. But the thing is, I was proud of me. And that was the last time my dad ever heard me play the piano. Thank you, Cynthia. That was a fabulous performance. Thank you so much for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You certainly have proved resilient despite setbacks stemming from your history. Your audition at Manhattan School must have been terrifying. How did you recover from that? And what do you think kept urging you to keep trying to get into that school? I don't know. I Honestly, I don't know. I had this, as I said, I had this burning desire to play the piano. And I auditioned, and when I when I got home back to Pueblo, and I got the letter saying I wasn't, I didn't get in. Honestly, I wasn't surprised because I knew my audition was not good. But I just had this thing. I had to go to New York. I I had to get into school. I had to be there. I just I just had to be there. I I don't know what it was. I had this drive, really, really, really strong drive. Well, that's great. Well, we may talk about that more when um, we um, bring Greg into it. I want to ask you, um, your, this excerpt is 20 minutes. And how long is the full show? And how many pieces of music do you perform in it? Uh, well, I actually, um, it's hard to imagine, but in this, what I just did just now, I performed 20 pieces. There were a lot of them were little snippets, but um, uh, in the regular show, which is about, well, the last one I did was 45 minutes. It can be as long as 50, 55 minutes, uh, around an hour. Um, I probably perform uh, 40 pieces, um, using them as examples for various and sundry things. Yeah. So. So what else ha happens in the show? Um, well, I, um, my, the first place, I have a hard time finding a place to live. And the first place I live is... Um, a place called the Salvation, um, it's a Parkside Evangeline Salvation Army Home for Women. And the practice room is in the basement, which is boiling hot, so I can't practice there. Um, I finally get a, a, a studio apartment. I move in there only to discover that my neighbor hates piano practicing, and he's constantly knocking on my door to make me stop practicing. Um, I get a carpet, and then I have this gigantic grand piano, and... My friend and I try to move the piano onto the carpet and it falls over flat on its back. Um, um, my piano teacher at Manhattan School was quite the old school um, piano teacher. And I do this whole segment about her teaching me how to play this Bach partita and um, how I have to love the piano. And 
Like she would call her students in the middle of the day all the time to ask to see whether they were practicing. So all these, all these <laughs> crazy, all these crazy things happened. I mean, nothing bad happened to me, but I just kept having these setbacks. But but all the time, I was just like focused on getting into school, and I did get into school. You were focused. You were. You were really. I was, yeah. Well, we have lots to talk about, but before I introduce our guest, Greg Rowe, let me take a moment to remind the audience that posted in the chat is the tip jar. Um, your tax-deductible support is greatly appreciated to keep the Marsh Stream platform available to our communities during this time of isolation and theater closure. 70% uh, of Marsh funding comes through ticket sales, and for this, we're counting on your support. Also, we encourage comments and questions from the audience, which our Zoom audience may post in the chat, or to our YouTube audience, you also may pose questions, and our producer, Brian and Brianna, will, will help us um, keep an eye on that and get those uh, comments to us. And um, all questions and comments will get to the performer, so we'll, of course, get to as many as we can in the live platform, but don't hold back. The chat is open now. And um, as we welcome um, into our conversation, Greg Rowe, uh, let me tell you something about him. Raised in a small town like Cynthia, Greg's exit strategy was not to New York, but Paris, where he was an exchange student rather than a journal and a journalist, rather. Um, at age 28, torn between hobnobbing and volunteering with patients with AIDS, Greg realized he had to leave media behind and do something to address a pandemic that seemed destined only for his community. He created a nonprofit and began running trainings and support groups for hospital staff struggling with burnout. He moved to San Francisco, where the World Wide Web was bubbling up, creating a future world with no borders and no expensive international phone calls. But after a short bubble in the dot communism, he called it, he went to grad school <laughs> right up in the uh, up the street from the marsh and became a psychotherapist. And today he has a practice in Santa Cruz and in San Francisco. And I also want to mention, we'll post this in the chat as well, um, as we'll post all the links uh, for Cynthia and um, Greg. Greg is seeking folks interested in having fun creating a platform so Americans of all stripes can have a short civil conversations with one another before the election. So you can find out more when you go to stopthebroshow.org and that'll be posted into the chat. Greg, welcome. So Thank good to you. have you. I appreciate it. Hi, Cynthia. Thank Hello, you for Greg. staying up late and having fun with us. <laughs> I know, right? Indeed. Cynthia is in New York, and um, and in fact, um, your neighbors have been very nice that you're playing piano at this hour of the night. Yes. <laughs> so um, let's start, Cynthia, with um, what prompted you to write this show? Um, well, I kept Originally, I kept thinking about these little stories of these little things that happened to me when I first came to New York, and I thought, oh, that might be really interesting to people uh, to know, you know, the the things that happen to an innocent person who comes to New York. Um, so that was the original thing, and I originally thought about it being a cabaret, actually, and I was looking for songs, and but that just didn't seem to gel together. And and then I started going to solo shows of of, their, of friends in New York City, and I was like, wow, maybe I could do a solo show. Um, and so that's what started me writing. And then, then I took a solo show class uh, with Austin Pendleton, which was awesome. And at the first class, he said, okay, next week, everyone's going to start presenting their shows. <laughs> so I had to start writing, like really writing. So, um, but what I discovered in the writing of the show was that it, a lot of it ended up being me unearthing my own history and my own family and my own relationship to my my parents and the um, the dynamic of music in our family and how that affected me and how like I I never understood why I got so horribly nervous when I played and why I always felt like you know people are telling me I was terrible all the time and were people on the show, telling actually, you were terrible? I'm sorry. Were people telling you you were terrible? No, oh. I was. No. <laughs> I was, I had this little chatter going on in my brain all the time telling me how awful I was. And so I was always self-sabotaging and writing my show really actually helped me um, come to figure that out and come to uh, grips with it. So it's been very cathartic for me also. So what did you learn about yourself and your relationship with your father and, and the family? Um, 
Well, one of the things I learned was that because I idolized my father and his jazz playing, and I felt like he was a god, he was like this king jazz player, amazing jazz player, that, um, that there was no place in that world for me. And so um, I had to, and I just recently actually discovered this, that, um, that if I outshone my father, I think it would have killed him. Like it would have killed his muse, you know? But as a kid, I didn't know that. I just thought that he thought I was awful. But he had his own demons he was dealing with, you know, as parents sure. oftentimes we do. Our own demons. And Greg, maybe that's something you can speak to because um, I think about my own therapist reminding me that, you know, my eight, we all have our own uh, demons, but my eight-year-old self is, it can, you know, is is allowed to be able to say, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like how you're treating me. Um, why are you ignoring me? I can't believe your father never, never went to see you perform in, in all the years of amazing performance that you've done. Yeah. So, so first of all, Greg, this is a common thing. I would think for parents and children, we all have this with, with our, with our family and how, how do we, um, how can we be empowered to have a conversation or, or language to uh, be able to help heal that situation? Oh, I didn't know you were going to ask me such a tough question to start off with. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I, I'm, here's what I was wondering. I was wondering if the Pueblo pediatrician who had a New Yorker magazine in his office in the 1960s also smoked cigarettes. I don't think so. No, no, no. Dr. Smith, no. And what was that New Yorker doing in a, a pediatrician's office in Pueblo, right? It was there for me. It was a sign. And that yeah. was the first time that you heard about the Manhattan School, was it? Um, not then. It was for Mr. Ibar. That's how I found out about Manhattan School. Oh, uh, okay. But so I wanted to talk about him. I mean, you know, you, you, you give him lots of gestures and all that, but Damn, he 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 saw your flame. He saw your feistiness. I, yeah. I wrote down, you'll go there one day, talking about the, the, the Carnegie Hall. Yeah. And I was I I wrote on the other side, like, I wanted to play with him. I wanted I, I it, you said the separation in our family, like it was all music's fault. And then you meet this guy in college. Isn't that amazing? The, I know. He was so wonderful. And, and he was from New York, you know, so he, he oh, brought this whole New York sensibility, you know, uh, to me. And I was just like, oh, I want to, you know, he was so international. And uh, yeah, just. Did the two ever meet? Your father and Francisco Ibarra? He probably did. I mean, because my dad came to, uh, 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 I think he came to my undergraduate recital. I think he did come to that when at De in Denver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure he met him then. I don't remember it, but I'm sure he did. Just and kind of is a distant the father, the warm one. <clears throat> sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, go I didn't ahead. know about Francisco. So Francisco was somebody that you had met at when you were um, performing in New York. No, no, he was my piano teacher in Denver. Uh Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he's the one that gave me the sheet with the scales and arpeggios, which I couldn't. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So to get back to your question earlier, uh, a little bit of part of it, the answer to your question is, and I, I told Cynthia this during our, our, our prep time uh, in rehearsing, is that uh, I love, Cynthia, I love that you give us those beliefs, because as soon as she started talking about voices in her head, the, the shrink in me immediately wanted to know, hmm, I wonder what her core beliefs are, you know? And so a little bit later, you play them, you're, you're playing this audition for us, which is excruciating. And suddenly we get to hear them. We get to hear all the voices, you know? I, yeah. I didn't hear I'm ugly or I'm this, but I'm sure they were all, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you overcome those? How, do you, how did you, I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, I think the first thing is- lots of auditions, right? I'm tons. sorry, can I say that again? You've been through tons of auditions, right? Um, yeah, yeah, but this is like a really, this is a big one. This was a big audition. No, 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 I understand that. But I mean, how does one overcome such self-destructive inner voices when one works in a field where you're constantly being rejected? Well, actually, it has nothing to do with that. 
Jesus. That has nothing to do with it because people who are in performing arts are rejected all the time. That's just part of it, right? So that's not, no, no, no. I think it's more that, um, first of all, you have to realize that those voices are inside of you. That's number one. Number two, you have to realize that um, because you give those voices truth, you, you know that those voices are telling you the truth, right? And when you realize that actually those voices are not telling you the truth at all, that, that, they're, that they're voices that you, you've allowed to live there, but they don't speak truth. So when you kind of, at least for me, when I separated those and realized that those voices were old voices I was carrying from a long time ago, and maybe in writing the show, it helped me understand may, perhaps where they come from. I mean, honestly, my, the daddy section, I've rewritten so many times. I can't even tell you how many times I've rewritten it. But, but I think that that's, that's really more over what it is. Um, Did yeah. you just say the writing of it helped you let go of them? Yeah. Ooh, look at that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because I really had to think about it. Mm. I really had to think about it. Because, um, because when I first did the show... Two years ago, a, a friend said, you know, I love, I, I love your show, blah, blah, blah. But I, I really wanted to know more about your relationship with your father. And I was like, oh, no, shoot. Darn it. I have to dig deeper. So but that was good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did want to know, there was, there's one piece that just after you, 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 you profess aloud to us all the, the, the harsh voices in your head. You play this lovely piece. It's, it's quite forlorn. It, it feels oh, like it's the, like the, late nineteenth century. Oh, the shoot the Chopin. Oh, was it Chopin? Okay. This one. Yeah. Yeah, it's a Chopin Nocturne. I played that along when I was in high school, I think, and I always loved it. When I was putting the show together, I was like, I oh, that's the perfect song for this for this spot. And do you use music as a, I don't know, to, to, to evoke an emotion or to, if you feel, or, or on, the, on the contrary, if you're feeling an emotion, like sadness, and you, you just play it out on a, on a piano sometimes, you ever do no, that? No, I'm not one of those people. I don't Yeah, <laughs> I, I've seen that phenomenon. And as a non-musician, it, it, you know, I, I use words, so I'm always surprised yeah. by that. Yeah, no, I, I don't do that. When I play or whatever, I, um, I'm actually, whenever I play or I sing too, whenever I do that, I actually feel full of um, life and energy and um, ideas. Like playing, creating music really makes my creative juices. Like, when I, you know, I, 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 sometimes I keep a pad by the, by the piano because I'm like, oh, this and this and this and this and this. Yeah. yeah. It, it opens up my creativity, actually. It, it makes me feel very... Um, Lively, it sounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll yeah. Start here. You didn't feel good enough. So that came from a place, really, from your family, maybe, and, and, your, and your dad, and, them not, and your mother, too, not coming to see you, see you perform. Yeah, I mean, I think my mom was caught between a rock and a hard place because she loved my father, and she wanted the best for us. And she knew that music was important to us, but she also understood that my father, music made my father distant and away. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, because she's the one who helped me get to get uh, grants and uh, scholarships to go to DU. She's the one who encouraged me to, to come to New York. In fact, she's the one who, in, you know, my dad said, she should just go out to college and I'm public, go, go out there, you know, don't, don't, she doesn't, doesn't have to go away to school. My mom's like, no, she has to go away to school. She has to get away. So my mom really understood that. Hmm. Yeah. From, we have a question from the audience. What uh, happened to your father and why was this the last time he heard you play when he went to the year recital? Uh, I don't know why it was the only time he, last time he heard me play because he lived, he died in 2017. No, 2007, I'm sorry. So um, I don't know why he never heard me play. He never asked to, to hear me play. He never came to New York. He never, um, when I would call him and we'd talk on the phone, we always talked about his music. He never asked me what I was doing. I think that he was intimidated by me in some kind of way. And I think that I did, by coming to New York, I think I did what he was afraid to do. And, you know, if I could psychoanalyze my father, I, 
I think, I think that a little bit. And, and like to say that out loud. Oh, I'm sorry, girl. Go I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I I think that sometimes I I feel bad for him that he he was threatened by his own daughter. Plus, the other thing was he played jazz, and jazz was like the thing, and classical music was just sort of like oh yeah. So it was like Cynthia's taken care of, you know. She's she's doing her classical, so, so she's taken care of. I don't really have to you know worry about that. That's done. Not understanding that I just. You know, I I wanted him to acknowledge it, you know, and tell me I was doing pretty good. Of course. And and what happened to your father? He stayed living in Pueblo. Um... Stayed living in Pueblo, and um, he and my he and my mother eventually divorced, and um, he lived. Um, he bought a house, you know, not far from where we grew up, and he he dedicated himself to music. He, he, uh, a big band music, he arranged music, he wrote music, he, um, put bands together, he played jobs. Um, I mean, honestly, I think my father probably should never have gotten married. I think that he really just wanted to do music. Wow. Yeah. There's a couple of comments here, just to let you know. Valerie David says, wonderful job, Cynthia. She was happy oh. to Oh, hi, and catching a train on the on the uh, crack of dawn tomorrow, so she's she's going to zoom uh, zoom out now. But she said congratulations and hope. Oh, and uh, Ellen Taylor Sisson said, "Love lovely watching you, Cynthia." Um, Peter Michael Marino. To oh, all he's my amazing director, Peter Michael Marino. Well, oh my gosh! Lots of claps and kudos to you. And um, Rhonda Musex says, "Bravo, captivating storytelling." And later says, "Heartbreaking." Um, getting back to your, um, you know, about your father that he really hadn't, um, uh, you know, su supported you directly and 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 talking to you, um, almost almost ignoring your your career. Um, yeah. So, again, back to you, Greg. <laughs> well. I, I, I'm, I'm just all excited. Uh, <laughs> so I'm wondering if you would be willing to recount, <clears throat> recount one of the stories that didn't make the cut, but that's really fun and worth telling of some kind of like quirky family story or a quirky New York story or oh, uh, come to mind. I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot either, but just in case. Well, I have this one whole. <laughs> I have this one whole bit when I had lived in the studio apartment next to this, my neighbor named Jim, who was a writer. And um, so I, I, I started off by saying, um, I don't know if you've ever lived next door to a classical pianist, but this is what practicing is like. And I play the same phrase over and over and over again, because that's what we do. And that poor Jim was like beside himself and he kept leaving notes under my door you know, asking me to stop, to stop playing, you know, and, and, uh, and that when, when I finally moved out of that apartment, I, um, I, I wrote a limerick to Jim <laughs> and I stuck it under his door and I, the limerick was something like, um, I, I don't remember the first two lines of the limerick, but the end of it was, and I hope the next person who moves in here plays the drums. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was so mean because he was always like banging on the door and oh my oh oh he wanted to oh this is the thing he wanted to create a red light green light system so that when I came home because I worked a, a day job he wanted um to put a red or green stickers on his door and if it was okay for me to practice meaning he wasn't home writing he put a green sticker on his door but if he was home writing I couldn't practice so he put a red sticker on his door Oh boy. So tell me, did, did you ever learn to play jazz piano? Not really. <laughs> no, not, not at all. I mean, I play musical theater and I, I play for English country dancing. And so I do a lot of improv improvising with that, but, um, and plus I, I do a, a temple, a church, a church and temple jobs, and especially temples. A lot of them, you have free flowing music. So I, I can improvise with all that stuff, but no, I never learned how to play jazz. It's sort of on my, um, my short list of things that I'd like to learn how to do, but it kind of intimidates me because I always thought that jazz players, um, like they just knew how to play. They didn't take <laughs> lessons and study that they just, you know, automatically could just sit down. And play. So I couldn't do that. So I thought, well, I can't play jazz. So no, I don't play jazz. So I think about, I'm sorry, Greg. What's English country music? English, English country music. 
Yeah. Um, so have you ever seen Jane Austen movies? Sure. The, the dancing that people do in Jane Austen movies, that's English country dance music. And there's a whole, oh my gosh, there's a huge movement in the United States and Europe of English country dancers. In San Francisco area, the Bay Area, there's a huge um, English country dance community. Yeah, so you should, uh, if you go to the website, uh, Country Dance New York, CDN, no, no, oh, CDSS, Country Dance and Song Society, um, they list all of the country dancing in the country, actually. It's great, social dancing, people meet each other, it's, it's really lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's three times I've interrupted you. Oh, no, not at all. I, I actually wanted to get back to um, you know, the question I, I posed earlier, because um, I, I do want to address, uh, you know, most of us have a problem in communication with someone or another. And when you have a father, you know, I know, you know, we, we, we lo love our parents and, and, and even in all their faults, you know, um, it's just the nature of life. And um, but when you have a parent that really is, you know, ignoring you or not really um uh engaging with you and and you have two languages the jazz and the classical and they're just not communicating with each other you know what what kind of language might we use to and it's not just kids but adults talking to other people and our parents as we um continue on because these patterns persist in life and i'll give you an example for myself that i always love and that is um uh, my son was in uh, therapy very young because my husband was ill and died, his father. And um, and he came home one day and said to me, Mom, um, I don't like your tone of voice. <laughs> and I was so taken aback because I never stopped to think of that. And it really made me think about it. It was something that was bothering him. And he suddenly, empowered by the therapist, had the language at little five years old <laughs> to say that to me. You know, so that was um, so now maybe, you know, that some parents wouldn't like that. But I think we're in an age where, you know, um, we are allowing children to, and hopefully we do listen to those kind of uh, you know, feedback that they'll give to us. And uh, this was um, aided again by, by a therapist. And I think it was really helpful in, in my relationship with my son at, at that age. I, I think that I would have been terrified to ask my father if he would teach me how to play jazz, because I think I was terrified that he would say um, no or that, you know, well, that's, that's not for you or something like that. So I would never, no, nah, I never, I never asked at all. Plus he you played the trombone, him, trombone and piano were different. Did yeah. you ever say to him, why don't you ever come to see me perform? Nope. Because you were afraid he'd just say, I don't, I'm not interested. Afraid of his answer. Uh, or I was afraid that Maybe I was afraid of his answer. Yeah. Um, and yet you're, you're, you're a, a very accomplished uh, per performing artist. And, um, and it's, it's interesting when, dare I say, when we have um, narcissistic parents that are very into their own lives, then how do we get get past that to, um, and you're a good example of it. Um, you really had this drive and this vision for what you wanted. Not every, not all of us have that. Um, well, I want to say that I, as you can imagine, when people are in therapy, we, we spend a lot of time talking about our parents and, you know, and it's, there's a, there's always a period where it's all their fault. And fortunately we get past that. And, but usually it's mom, isn't it? No, just kidding. <laughs> oh God, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All over the place. Um, but I, I want to say that that in all the years I've been doing therapy, the I've only had one parent agree to come in and sit with their adult kid who said, who, and, and who was able to take in, like, yeah, I think there's some ways you kind of effed up. And, 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 and I just want you to hear that. And, you know, it left, it left scars. But I, I, I think it's sad. It's 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 amazing how many of my clients, unprompted, have said to me, "Shouldn't parents create a little fund to pay for their kids' therapists after they turn 18? <laughs> <laughs> but 
But you know what I think? I think that we have to forgive our parents. I truly believe we have to forgive our parents because I believe that unless they're totally messed up people who do evil things, which there certainly are parents like that, but most parents are just sort of mildly messed up, right, or whatever. But the, the parents are coming from their own backgrounds and their own parents, and, you know, it comes down generation after generation. So I think truly we have to forgive them because it's the only way that we can really heal ourselves. You know, I can't change what happened. I cannot change the past, and I cannot change, you know, anything. But what I can change is right now. And the only way I can do that is to get, forgive my father, you know, and forgive my mother, and, and, and that's it. And I, I, I really believe that very, very strongly. Ultimately. And, well, fortunately, these discussions go the other way, too, because that, allow, that allows a parent to say to their kid, well, here... Here, here, here's the situation. Here's here were here were the constraints that you don't know about. Here were, right. you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, right. it, yeah, exactly. I, that, that is a real gift. Uh, but something like that happens all the time in couples. Uh, you know, I um, every humans, I, I think every humans their own planet. You know, sometimes I have couples. I'll just say to tell you, tell your husband what it was like to be raised. Uh, a, a Jewish girl on the West Coast with hippie parents, and you, you know, tell her what it was like to be raised a Protestant Bostonian and stuck in San Francisco. You know what I mean? It's, right. it's, it's the different languages and different cultures, and so yeah, I I have them teach each other about each other's planets in a way. Right. And I right. think kids and parents can do that. Well, an an interesting thing was that when I was putting the show together, um, um, I. I spoke to my mother about many of these things that I talk about in my show. Um, and I, I, because I wanted her, because I, if, if, and when she saw the show, I didn't want her to be upset and I didn't want, um, I, di I didn't want her. I, I just wanted to talk through everything with her. And I think for her, just like you're talking, it was very cathartic because she could say to me as an adult now, you know, mm -hmm. not being an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old, but an adult, so talking adult to adult, tell me how she was feeling in the marriage and how she was, you know, the things that were going on, her, on with her in relationship with my father, some of which I knew and some of which I picked up as kids do, right? But there was a lot of stuff that I didn't know or I didn't fully... So, so that, in a sense, it was really lovely for her, I think, to be able to use me writing about my show for her to be able to talk about things that were, you know, a long time ago, but we still so the show was, That's great to hear. The show was cathartic for your mother yes. and, um, and, you know, perhaps uh, your father, but your father didn't, your father never saw the show. No, no, no. Oh no. The show was not even in, in, in the back of my brain by the, when my father passed away. But I do have to say that my father was very sick the last six months of his life, and I was able to go to Colorado um, a, a number of times. And it was probably, um, you know, when I was there, I went to see him every day, and we spent hours talking. And, and, I, and I kind of felt like, um, and I said this to him, you know, this is kind of, I know this is a funny thing, but it's, it's really wonderful that we, ha we have this time now to really speak to each other um, just talking. Um, we still didn't talk about my music. We didn't talk about that, but we talked about all, all sorts of other things, you know, and I would call him every day when I was back in New York. And, um, so we actually got much, much closer, um, in the last six months of his life. So I'm really grateful for that. Totally grateful. That's wonderful. Well, it was a cathartic piece for you and, and your family. And, um, it was a hard to go through as a child. And I think especially as children, there's a lot of children that, do um are ignored or or are abused and they you know do need a way to be able to protect themselves and and you um were very resilient and continued on i'm amazingly our time is already at, at coming to an end um oh. so i want to thank you a very special thank you cynthia shaw for tonight's oh presentation of Velvet Determination, and to psychotherapist, journalist, producer, 
filmmaker Greg Rowe. You, you've done so many things. Um, this show is cached on our Solo Arts Heal page if you're looking for the resources we posted tonight. And um, and all, uh, all the information will um, get to our performers tomorrow. There's one last comment here um, from Denora in New York. Wonderful, Cynthia. Hello. As you know, I love theater. There are musical and plays with music. How were you able to create your show not to come across as a talkie with music background, but doing music as some of the dialogue? And that's true. You do music as some of the dialogue. You know, it's just part of a, a character. I had to work on that, work doing that. Um, uh, my director, uh, Peter Michael Marino, really encouraged me to do that. Um, and I had also seen, I don't know if you know, this wonderful pianist, Hershey Felder, who does shows um, based on uh, certain composers. And he does that also. So he inspired me to be able to talk and play at the same time. So That's fantastic. Well, it's very pleasurable to watch your show. I've seen your full show and recommend it to everyone. Um, when, when we finally come out of isolation in our, in our boxes, we'll be able to <laughs> enjoy more. So again, um, thank you so much. Um, and everyone can look for upcoming solo arts heal show on the March stream. Um, I do want to announce next week, September 30th, join us for Amy Ostriker in her musical show, gutless and grateful following sold out runs at the triad, New York city, the Bijou theater, United Solo Festival, Feinstein's 54 Below, and, and more, plus a nationwide tour from D.C. to Hawaii. The captivating Amy brings her hit one-woman show, Gutless and Grate Grateful, to the marsh. And th it's interwoven song and dialogue. Um, she shares a primal piece of live storytelling, weaving her near-death experience and expiring perspective with an eclectic set of songs, comedically highlighting struggles, triumphs, and beautiful detours in her life. She's a performer, a speaker, and an author. And um, I, I hope you'll join us for her, Amy's musical journey of determination, grit, and guts as she shares her humor and strength and gutless and grateful next week. Again, thank you both and to our Zoom and YouTube audiences, Marsh Dream producers Brian and Brianna, and to artistic director Stephanie Wiseman. We're all in this together. We'll see you next week. Brian? All right, perfect. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Greg. And a huge thank you um, to Gail Shickley, our host for Solo Arts Heal, here every Wednesday on the Marsh Stream. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.